and Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Sharon Florentine. Welcome to today's webinar, Don't Let Third-Party Vulnerabilities Run Wild, brought to you by MergeBase. We have an awesome webinar for you today, as always, but before we get started, I need to go through some housekeeping items with you. First, please remember that this webinar is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of it, you'll be able to go back and watch it again. We'll be sending an email with instructions for accessing the webinar on demand, but you can always visit us. It will be there for you as well on our sites. Please remember too, you can submit questions using the Q&A tab on your console at any time. So go ahead and get those questions in and we will try and get to as many as we can throughout and at the end of the webinar. We will uh, also be doing a drawing at the end for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So stick around and see if you are a winner. All right, uh, with that, I am pleased to introduce to you Julius Musso. He's the CTO at MergeBase. And Julius, I'm going to turn my camera off and let you get right into it. But uh, folks, you'll hear me um, popping in and out with some, some questions here as Julius goes through his presentation. So. Let's get to it. Okay, hello, hello. Um, thank you so much, Sharon. Uh, yeah, I'm Julius Musso, and um, I'm the CTO and co-founder here at MergeBase. Um, at MergeBase, um, we're working specifically on an AppSec problem here. Um, AppSec being application security. And uh, we're working on what's called the software composition problem. Um, for the last 15 years, software has been increasingly built from open source components and libraries. These libraries and components now constitute the majority of the global software supply chain. And, and this trend is increasing, you know, every year it, it seems more frameworks, more libraries um, coming from uh, open source repositories. Um, this XKCD comic, um, created by Randall Monroe. It's talking really about digital infrastructure generally rather than application security, but it's essentially the same problem. Weaknesses in one part of the supply chain can bring the whole thing crashing down. Um, if we look specifically at a software system, you know, rather than all of global IT infrastructure, um, whether it's software you've built yourself or software that you've purchased, it's going to look a lot like this. Um, you're gonna have the, sorry, I'm just trying to grab the pen here, see if I can draw on the slide. Um, how do I make my little um, thing get out of the way there? Well, it looks like I can't get at the pen there, but um, you'd see the stuff in light blue at the top, that's uh, your own proprietary software. And then it's going to be calling into these um, these libraries um, that help you build your system. Um, however, the problem is that some of these libraries are going to have known vulnerabilities within them that attackers and adversaries can then exploit to, to breach your system, make it do things that you never wanted it to do. Um, in a way, software is becoming more and more like the automotive industry, right? Um, and the nice thing in the automotive industry is that the supply chain has been making cars safer. Um, so these days, um, the cars there's have an inventory of parts, and all of those parts are tracked um, in the individual cars that are driving them around, right? And then if there's a problem with a given component of your car um, that causes your driving to be unsafe, well, then what happens, right? You're gonna get one of these in the mail, or perhaps the next time you go to the dealership to get an oil change, they're gonna type in your VIN number and they're gonna be like, oh, uh, your airbag has a problem. Uh, the manufacturer is gonna repair that for free, right? So a well-tracked, well-understood supply chain in the automotive industry is making everything safer. Now, in the software industry, unfortunately, uh, this is really not the case. Uh, the adversaries really have the edge here. I'd say that the open source uh, software has, in a way, made software more dangerous. 
right? Like consider I've built my system, um, happily running system. I've got it running on, on, on the internet and it's doing its stuff, doing what it needs to do. Um, however, the bad guys in this case, for and the bad guys, it could be, you know, whoever wants to breach the system, get into it, you know, for profit or, or for information, for whatever reason, they can access, uh, you know, automated systems that just are probing websites and web applications uh, across the internet repeatedly. They're just probing them continuously, looking for vulnerabilities, right? Like, so for example, like Rapid Scan is an open source vulnerability scanner. You can download, install it, start running it right away. Um, it's, it's, so, you know, it's like that, like the developers are, are put, doing their best to put together a working system, but meanwhile, the attackers, all they have to do is find one exploit, right? And then they can just, um, you know, attempt that exploit against thousands of, of web applications to see if there's one that they can get into, sort of become a plug and play for exploits. Um, Any any um, any questions? Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> so that shows you how great I am with technology. Um, yeah. So if I mean, how often does this problem affect uh, companies? I mean, if a, say a company has never been breached from a vulnerable library before, what makes you so sure that it's going to happen? Um, yeah, so I think a lot of people, right, like they haven't been breached themselves, or at least not that they're aware of, right? And so they're like thinking, well, you know, maybe this is a problem for people that, um, you know, are, are lax in their in their hygiene, or or people that are big targets that like Sony, etc., that people want to get into. But the problem is really is the repeatable nature of the attack, right? So the attacker once they've put together a good exploit that can you know probe for a vulnerability they can just apply that everywhere and then and you might not even realize you've been breached um we we run a, a website uh, just for demonstration purposes called struts.mergebase.com and <laughs> three or four times a year it was getting popped now this you know none of our main website referenced this there was it was not you know in Google's index, there was no way to click to it. And yet somehow adversaries, we traced them back to China actually, um, were able to, to get into this. In, in this case, we found that they were, um, you know, using all the CPU, 100% CPU. So that's how we would notice that our demonstration system had been popped. And of course, we're not the only ones, right? Like um, here's a number of breaches in the last five years where uh, software, a software supply chain vulnerability has been a contributing factor. Yeah, that solar winds one specifically is one that really people constantly point to as the that's kind of the unfortunately they're kind of the poster child for supply chain exploits. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there that was a very interesting one where yeah. um seems to be a vulnerability in the build system, which and then the build system itself is, you know, is built from open source components as well. Yeah. So why Open, why are open source libraries that vulnerable? Are they just lower quality or what's the, what's the major problem there? Um, my, my experience with open source libraries, I'm actually an Apache committer myself. And uh, for about 10 years, I had a small open source library that was reasonably popular and successful called Not Yet Commons SSL. And, you know, in my personal practice, and maybe this is just me, I actually found that my open source code was much higher quality, better documentation, better unit tests, better architecture. And that's because, you know, one, it was going out there, it was public, there was going to be more eyes on it. Um, in with Apache stuff, they have a very strict code review policy, right? And so everyone was reviewing all the contributions and looking at them and, and anyone could you know, do a minus one vote, which meant the code wasn't going to be. And I, you know, I received minus one votes on some of my contributions. So my experience actually open source code is higher quality. However, 
that famous maxim, right? With all, with more eyes, you know, with a million eyes on the software, all bugs become shallow. Well, the problem I mm -hmm. think with open source is that with a million eyes on it, you know, probably maybe a hundred of those eyes, they spot a bug and they realize that they can use that bug to to breach systems. Ah. Uh. And then the other problem too is just patching, right? Like. Uh, suppose a bug is discovered and publicized and, and, you know, everyone be careful, get off this version of strats, right? But the whole industry as a whole is not able to pull that off, right? You know, maybe 95% of all web applications are going to leap forward to the safer version, but that 5% that are left behind just because they're distracted or they didn't realize they're running that vulnerable version, right? That they're the ones then that are going to get breached. Got it. So moving on to the solution, um, the problem, right? Like if you're using open source versions, you're going to now and again, you're going to be running a, a bad one, a bad version of a library that has a serious vulnerability. So what do you do about that? And I, I really here at MergeBase, you know, after working on this now for three years, I really break the solution into two parts. First, we have to identify all the libraries. And then second, once we've identified them all, we need to then um, see if there's any vulnerabilities. So I'm going to dive in depth here on this first part, component identification, right? So for component identification, you have your software system. It's made of all these libraries. You know, you have a mix of internal libraries um, and then uh, external libraries. These the, so the the light blue ones are the internal libraries that you know your teams are putting together to build your system, and then the darker blue ones are the open source libraries. And then for each of these, what you need to do is you need to identify its name and its version. So say like you know this one on the bottom left corner here, that little square. We're going to be like, well, what is that one? And it's 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 harder than it looks actually figuring out their name and their version. You think maybe you could just look at the file, right? It says you know, Commons Collections three two one. Well, what is that really? Now once you've done that, once you've identified for each one of these its name and its version, um, you can build reports, right? For example, S bomb is a popular industry standard report and uh, MergeBase of course supports that. So an SBOM, it stands for Software Bill of Materials. The idea being that it's a report that accurately lists uh, the complete inventory of components in a system. And then once you have an SBOM report, you know you can ship it off into other tools that will tell you if there's vulnerabilities or licensing issues or, or other problems. Um, so here's a bit of Shakespeare, right? What's Apache struts? It is not hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a computer. Oh, be some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So my point here is, um, suppose you have Apache struts in your system, but suppose it's been renamed right for whatever reason or suppose just a, a, a you know maybe a 50 percent uh, subset of apache struts you know a partial copy paste happened and then that partial copy paste got renamed too the problem is right is that you're still vulnerable but because it's been renamed or because its name has become a bit more complicated um you won't necessarily be able to then take your system, generate an SBOM, and cross-check that against the vulnerability database, but you're still vulnerable. Right? So um, this component identification problem, it really relies on the names being stable, but but they're not necessarily. You know, going more in depth on that, right? Um, you have the way the software components are articulated in source versus in in the binary. Right, that, that, so the, the names can be articulated in a different, completely different fashion. Uh, you have the boundaries of, of the components. And for example, like when I deploy my small Java web application, right, it's going to sit in one little folder, but that folder then is sitting in a larger JBoss or, or Tomcat deployment, right? And so and that's bringing in additional components. So what are we talking about when we, we talk about a system? Are we talking about my little web application? Or are we talking the larger deployment stack? 
um, partial copies, embedded copies. You know, I've seen things where a library contains a library, which itself contains a library, right? So what do you do about that? Um, common practices in software engineering are minification, you know, to make the, the, the asset smaller. Obfuscation is rarer. Uh, especially with open source, because often obfuscation uh, breaches the copyright license. But there are uh, cases where, the, where that is happening. And then, you know, just people building things, sometimes they do weird stuff. Right? And so all of these things are, are challenges that make component identification harder. And then on top of that, right, that's um, just you know, when you're looking at the components on disk, the, all of those challenges are happening, but then also which phase of your uh, development cycle are you going to apply your component identification? Are you going to try and identify the components in your source control? Or are you going to, you know, do you want to identify them all at the build time? Or do you want to employ them to, eh, sorry, identify them all at, at production, at runtime, right? You know, Nice thing is, like, when you shift left, then it's cheaper to fix, right? Like, if we, if you notice there's a problem, a, a serious vulnerability at the coding time, well, then, you know, it's probably 10, 20 minutes to be like, oh, let's change that to a different version, you know, if you're lucky. Wayne, while on shifted far right there on the production side, well, that that's the reality. That's what we're trying to protect, right? But more expensive to fix things there, harder, like you might have release cycles, build cycles, QA cycles to get through. And, um, you know, just to highlight Merge Base's uh, abilities here, you know, um, we're unique in that you can point us at a source system or a binary system and, and we're able to achieve the component identification. Um, and of course, we're gonna give you that list of components you know as a web report if you like clicking on the on the, on the tool itself or uh, if you want you can extract it as an sbom report here's a, just a sample where I, I took atlassian jira and just pointed merge base at it and uh you know a small snippet of the sbom report that came out after uh, scanning jira so now that we have all the components identified, moving on to the next phase of the problem, vulnerability management. So assuming we have an accurate list of components, of course that accuracy is very key, right? If your list is giving you components that you don't have or wrong versions or wrong names, you know, then this next exercise is gonna be a bit more chaotic. But assuming you have an accurate list of components, right? Next, what you want to do is for each one of them, uh, determine if there's any serious known vulnerabilities that have been uh, published about about the uh, component. You know, we're basically trying to put together a, a sort of a parts recall, just like in the automotive industry. So Merge Base, we, uh, we maintain our own vulnerability database. And to keep that up to date, you know, we're looking at several vulnerability sources every day and, and downloading them every day. Uh, we look at NVD, that's uh, US government's NIST's NVD, uh, stands for National Vulnerability Database. We're looking at uh, bug and issue trackers in GitHub. We're looking at uh, security advisories coming out of Microsoft, for example, and, and several other sources that we, uh, you know, uh, download and, and combine and curate every day. So, given your list of components, um, we've determined in this example that three of them are vulnerable, right? And so, what now? What do you do? You have your system built from these libraries, and yeah, and three of these libraries could uh, could cause problems. They could be abused. Essentially, the the libraries can be, you know. Um, put into situations that, where they behave uh, not as you hoped, but <laughs> and do things that you don't want them to do. So, um, oh, backing up there, sorry. really the options then, I mean, you could ignore it. That's always, you know, head in the sand. But um, aside from that, uh, you can patch the library. Like when people say patching, what they mean is, you know, 1.2.3 is vulnerable, 1.2.4 is not vulnerable. Let's upgrade the library. 
Uh, you could monitor the library to see, you know, is my system using it? Is my system using it in a way that, you know, makes us vulnerable to the exploit? And then, um, or finally, maybe you could pull the library out of your system. Maybe you don't need that library, or maybe you could block that that vulnerable bit of functionality. So let me, um, if I might jump in here quick, what mm -hmm. if, um, if, if you choose patch, what if there's not a patch available? Or what if for some reason the team can't apply any of the available patches? Yeah, so um, exactly. Like, you know, sometimes you might have an old uh, legacy system. Uh, and we, we talk about that in one of our case studies um, where you don't really have an active team uh, maintaining the, the, the software anymore, right? So you don't have a team that knows how to build it, that knows how to make changes, that knows how to patch it. Uh, so in that case, um, what can you do? Right. And, and the merge base is really unique in this regard in that uh, we do have some options for you. And I'll, I'll go into that uh, later during the case studies. Gotcha. Sorry, I jumped ahead of you, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah so merge base can, um, can help teams with patching, with monitoring, and also with uh, blocking or removing the library um, here. So I'll, I'll take a, a a uh, substantial look at our uh, capability here around patching. So here is an example. Uh, it's a Postgres uh, JDBC driver, so a common component. It's in a lot of systems, right? And the system we were looking at was on uh, version, I'm just going to grab a pen here. I think I figured out how to do that. So we're going to look at uh, yeah, version 42.2.4. It's a version that this system was on. And uh, we want to upgrade, you know, because of this this vulnerability. It's a vulnerable version. So uh, some of the factors to consider would be, you know, it, how popular is the version I'm upgrading to, um, how compatible, reverse compatible is it, and how many vulnerabilities is, right? So like 42.2.4 has this serious vulnerability. Well, should I just go to 42.2.5? That one might still be vulnerable. Um, and then should it, how about if I go to 42.2.12.jre6? Well, I mean, you can see there, it has a lower reverse compatibility score. So maybe that's not a, a good candidate either. So what Microsoft does is to try and help uh, your team with this patching decision, we try to get all this information in front of you in one spot quickly so you can see. So for each version here, so this is a version, and this is a version, and this is a version. Um, we have an indicator here of you know how vulnerable is it. So you can see by the time we get over here, there the vulnerability has been removed. You can see that in the table here too, right? So it went from one vulnerability then uh, to zero vulnerabilities with the 42.2.13. Um, meanwhile, these bars here are an indicator of the reverse compatibility with the version we're currently on, right? So recall that we're on 42.2.4. So what we've done is um, using data that's available to us, uh, we've taken 42.2.4 and then um, assessed its reverse compatibility with all of these versions that are in front of us. And so you can see that the ones that you know end in .jre6 or .jre7, they have lower compatibility scores, whereas the ones that don't end in that .jre, they have the highest compatibility score at 97% reverse compatibility. Right? And so taking all those factors together, I think what we quickly realized um, here is that this version has a good reverse compatibility, 97% here, and it also has no vulnerabilities. And, uh, and it's also um, the most popular in, in of, the, of the potential candidates in front of us right now. You can see the popularity of this one is uh, 162 uh, versus um, some zeros, ones, and then a 12 and a 38. Right? So, you know, um, that's how merge base can help teams with, the, with this patching decision, you know, because it's not really necessarily that straightforward. Moving on, um, monitoring, right? Uh, like we're saying, you can um, 
check and see if uh, if the library, the vulnerable library itself, is it being used by your system, or is the vulnerable section of the library being used, right? And you can um, uh, connect merge base to um, you know various uh, event and notification systems such as Slack or Syslog, Splunk Curator, for example. Um, here's an example from uh, from Slack, where you know decided to monitor the the library, and we can see it got used, got invoked. Um, remediation option number three uh, is removing the library or blocking the library. So um, what's interesting here, right, is because MergeBase is, is looking at these libraries in runtime, it actually has a notion of, um, of usage, right? Like how much is the library, has it been used in the last 24 hours? And then this one right here is really interesting, right? So like this, unloaded, right? And so what that means is that the library, which has four vulnerabilities, um, and it's been running in this example, I believe it's been running for a month, this particular library that comes co-deployed with the system, um, you know, hasn't even been loaded, right? And so, like, I mean, these other ones, perhaps they were loaded during the startup sequence or during a, a rare, um, bit of processing that the system needs once a day or once a month or something. But this one just has never been referenced at all. So this is a great candidate for, for removing the library outright from the system. Another thing we can do as well is try blocking uh, the library at runtime, right? So what I could do is I could like click on this one and then hit block and, uh, and that will stop the library from, from executing. So that's, I mean, that's how a merge base can help you with these these, these three options. Um, and getting this telemetry is very, very key for informing the team, especially around removal decisions. Because I mean, the more libraries you can remove from your system, right? You're essentially shrinking the attack surface. There's, there's less uh, software to be exploited by, by attackers. Um, so let's back up a second. So is this problem real? And so just a quick uh, sanity check here. Um, Atlassian uh, makes an on-prem version of, of uh, you know, their flagship products available for teams to try out and, and deploy on-prem. And so I thought, well, let's grab the latest version of Jira and let's just uh, run it through the scanner and see see what, uh, what MergeBase reports back. Um, curious if there's uh, anyone in the audience running Jira on-prem. And uh, I guess I should have made that a poll, but <laughs> we didn't. And uh, any Atlassian staff in the audience? Anyone? Any you can just pop that right in the chat if you are. We'll take it as a no, if not. <laughs> OK, well, uh, drum roll here. Let's uh, move to the next slide. Oh, I put a dot on there. Um, here, here's our scan of uh, the latest version of Jira, right? And uh, sure enough, we find um, uh, Jackson Databind 299, which is a pretty famously uh, insecure version of that library, right? With um, a lot of different uh, deserialization gadgets are possible when that library is on your system. Um, and in this case, I mean, this this library was inside a library, inside a library, like it was nested quite deeply inside a, another library. So I, I'm wondering if if um, that might be why Atlassian hasn't perhaps noticed that that's uh, present. And then a few other vulnerabilities as well. Um, yeah, I surprised there's quite an old version of Bouncy Castle in their in their bin directory. So I, that might be part of the startup routine or something. Yeah, so I mean, even you know, Jira from a week ago is uh, showing a lot of uh, a lot of vulnerabilities uh, in a few of its components. Um, yeah, just quickly recap this, right? Like, what are some of the options um, that you can apply during the different phases of? Um, of your development process. So during the development phase, um, if possible, it's nice to stop the developer um, from from committing, bringing in a new vulnerable dependency. So th that's something we support. We have a uh, you know plugins for GitHub and for Bitbucket to to stop developers very early 
on in their development process. You know, they try to bring in that new library that they were doing some research on and oh, but they picked a, you know, when they copy pasted from Stack Overflow, that was an older version that where there's some vulnerabilities. So we can stop them right away. We like, be like, nope, this pull request is failing because you're bringing in a new vulnerability. At build time, we can, um, assess you know your your software system for vulnerabilities at build time and and we can kill the build if you know if vulnerabilities above a certain threshold are are observed and then during the test and operate phases uh merge base allows you to uh block and monitor vulnerable libraries right at runtime run uh diving into a couple of case studies um so someone we worked with, they had, um, you know, a policy of no serious vulnerabilities in production. Um, but of course, to uh, pull that off, you know, you need to patch your libraries. And so um, what they like to do is to, uh, they wanted some additional data to help prioritize a patching effort, right? So they're using merge base to determine if the vulnerability is reachable. So reachable vulnerabilities where, you know, uh, normal system behavior is is going through the vulnerable section of the code, these are prioritized. Whereas unused libraries or libraries where the vulnerable section is not being executed during normal system operation, these were you know considered lower priority. And so in this case, uh, merge base with our runtime telemetry is able to provide that data. And of course, you know, in some cases, the library was never used at all. And so that helped the customer uh, realize that they could uh, you know, remove that library from their system. Uh, however, I just wanted to highlight a myth, uh, a very common myth that we encounter a lot um, in our conversations, which is um, if it's not invoked, you're not vulnerable. Right? Well, uh, the, the famous Struts Equifax uh, breach of, of 2017 is a counterexample to this. Um, in that case, the um, there was an error handling routine um, that would trigger if a bad content type was posted, right? Well, nobody ever posts bad content types. And so that error handling routine was never getting invoked during normal operation. And so if you were you know, watching your system, you'd be like, oh, we're safe. Um, you know, that this vulnerable section of code is never executed, but then the attacker can coerce your system into, into going into that vulnerable section, right? The attacker ends up having far more control over making your system do things you don't want it to, right? I'd say like for denial of service attacks and cross-site scripting attacks, um, in those cases, yeah, if, if your execution is not normally passing through those routines, then probably you're not vulnerable. But for RCE, which is, uh, you know, remote code execution, um, often, uh, you know, a few of your libraries are, are being exploited together in concert um, in ways that they never normally never would execute um, to, to create the vulnerability. And so, yeah, if it's not invoked, that doesn't necessarily, or even if it's not reachable, right? Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you're safe. Uh, the attacker can often, um, you know, kind of compel your system into making the, the vulnerable library reachable, um, even though previously it wasn't. Uh, here's another study. Um, in a, a large bank where they uh, wanted to secure some of their older systems, right? So they have you know, the, the bank, it's going to have, right, like on the order of a thousand to two thousand uh, systems. This is a common, even in some cases, three thousand systems that they're running. It's a, it's a crazy number of systems. Um, of course, maybe around two to three hundred of those are actively de maintained, actively developed systems. And then the rest are just in a holding pattern. You know, they're stable, they do their thing, they perform their business function. Um, so a new corporate mandate heads come in, you know, patch all critical vulnerabilities. But when you don't have active teams working on these older holding pattern systems, really there's no team available to even do the patch, right? So in this case, uh, merge base, you know, allows, um, allows you to, to monitor these systems, these older systems without actually breaking them or perturbing them. You know, you can just shut it down apply merge base to that system, bring it back up, and now all the jar files and other and components are being monitored for potential um, vulnerabilities.
So in that regard, the Umbridge list can be a great alternative when you can't patch. Yeah, so uh, I'll give you guys um, a quick demo here of, of our runtime capability. Uh, I'm going to just share my entire screen so you can see what, uh, what this webinar looks like from my point of view for one second. And there. OK. So um, what I've got here is, OK, wants me to log back in. And um, we've got a mix of scans and live systems here. So blue is scans, and uh, and green are the uh, the live systems. So uh, you know, our uh, this is the scan of Jira I did just a few days ago. You can see that Jira eight nineteen zero, and then um, but our own Jira is a bit older. So it's kind of interesting. You can see right, like the newer Jira. Um, it has more components, seven hundred and four components, compared to our older Jira. I think we're running a year old Jira. But the newer Jira, you can see they do try and stay on top of their vulnerabilities, right? So they have seventy-seven vulnerabilities in this new Jira, whereas the one we're running, we should probably we should probably patch that and take the latest upgrade because our Jira's got turned in seventy-three. But that's not really the system I want to um, highlight for the demonstration here. We have a, a system that we've preceded with uh, with some vulnerabilities. We just call it Struts, and so I'm going to go over to that Struts system. And so these are the libraries, and you can see, um, you know, the libraries. Some of them are heavily used. Some of them are not even loaded. Um, and just show just the vulnerable ones. And so I'm gonna, and then here's that that system, and I'm gonna log into it. Uh, not using a very good password. And. Um, yeah, just a very simple web application. You know, it's got a form where I can enter some data. And, um, and then I can, has another page where I can see the data that I've added, uh, entered. And then you can, um, sorry, and then you can, over here, um, you know, as I'm using that system, um, these invocations are, are, are being collected and monitored. Um, you know, I only have a few minutes to do a live demo here. So um, normally I would, you know, do an attack and breach the system and then show how MergeJS can block the attack. But um, I think um, just for the sake of time, um, what I'm going to show instead. So there's this library doesn't have any uh, vulnerabilities with it, but I'll just show you that I can you know, turn that library off, for example. So yeah, success. So the Commons Collections uh, library, which um, as we see, it has two vulnerabilities, which we are suppressing at the moment from our reporting. Um, However, I've turned that library off so that it, it won't execute in the system anymore. And you can see that that then, it turns out that library is part of the rendering of this table. And so uh, when I go back to that table, the table's not rendering anymore because it can't, because, because that library is no longer allowed to execute. Um, so I'll just go back and turn that library back on. So I'll hit the reset button. And um, now you can see that the library's going on. So I, just showing you, like we have this this runtime, um, we're binding to the system at runtime, so we're able to to really keep an eye on these libraries. Um, and um, sure, yeah, what was the other one I wanted to show? Which was with the yeah, for example, um, you know. So that's where you're blocking the whole library, but um, you know maybe you just want to block the vulnerable code, right? So what I can do is I can just, um, for example, block the few lines of code that are affiliated with this vulnerability. I mean, this is just a really quick demonstration here of of this of the merge base tool and some of its capabilities. Um, love to really go more in depth, uh, showing off this. Um, 
with uh, demos with with anyone who's interested. Any questions? You've actually got quite a few really good questions here. So um, get your get your catcher's mitt ready here because I'm going to start throwing these at you. Um, okay. So. Um, MergeBase knows exactly when vulnerabilities in the library are executed in production. Is that correct? And how is that possible? Uh, yeah, yeah, and that's um, that's actually um, we've been granted a patent on that technology. Um, and so, you know, what we do is we actually um, instrument the library. So, like I said. Um, earlier during the case study, you, you would shut down the system and then you would apply a uh, merge base on your system. And what it will go in and do is um, instrument the libraries. Um, so it just adds a tiny little call um, to intercept um, all the function invocations just so that we can then collect that data and and possibly block or monitor those those functions. So, you know, essentially we are um, injecting this instrumentation into the libraries to, to give us this ability. Okay, that makes sense. So here's another good one. Is blocking a library dangerous and can it break the system? Yeah, yeah, of course it can um, break the system. Yeah, I mean, it's just like any software development activity, right? Um, you know, you know, adding that line of code, updating that library, removing a line of code, these are all potentially can have uh, negative side effects. Uh, and just as I showed in the demonstration, right, like when I blocked the library, this table was no longer able to render. Um, so what we would recommend, you know, if, if you've got a, 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 a bad emergency, let's say you've got a really serious vulnerability in one of your running systems um, and you need to do something about it now, um, we would recommend, you know, uh, taking uh, the monitoring approach and you can monitor the whole library or um, you can also uh, monitor um, uh, by uh, um, uh, CVE granularity as well. So this CVE affects this line of code. So let's monitor that and, and see if that's uh, being invoked as well, right? And then if you you can build confidence that um, you know that that's not being invoked, and uh, and then uh, block it. Because I mean, really, what you want to avoid is uh, leaving that in place, such that an attacker can compel your system to to go into that vulnerable section. But just to give yourself confidence that you're not going to break, we recommend doing the monitoring initially. Got it. That makes sense too. Um. So why are there so many unused libraries in a system? Yeah, that's a great question. Um. I, the reason for that, uh, I think, really has to do with like why not, right? Like if you, um, so you can see all these unused zeros, and then a lot of unloaded here in this example. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're developing a library, I, I've been a, a developer of libraries myself. Uh, I've contributed to Apache Commons Codec, Apache Commons Lang, and you might develop a, a feature in that library maybe some date formatting or some math or whatever. And then that feature becomes just a small part of the library, but it might require additional um, libraries to fulfill that feature. So when you're in that, when you're a developer of that library, you know, you're trying to add an exciting new feature and you think, okay, I'll just add an extra dependency. And now I have this nice new feature. Meanwhile, the people that are using your library um, they might not be using this exciting feature you've added, right? Like this new feature you've added might represent only one tenth of the library, and you know that either ninety percent doesn't require that dependency. But because um, you know the library developer doesn't, they don't know how you're going to use the library, right? Like they have an idea. This is what this is meant for, but they don't know if you're going to use a hundred percent and probably not a hundred percent of its functionality. Probably, you know, you're just really focused on your use case. And so you're just going to use a really narrow limited part of the library to fulfill your requirements. And so, I mean, it really comes down to that, right? Which is, so the library has additional features that you're not using, but 
they don't know that you're not using them. And so they have to bring down the full, you know, set of potential dependencies just in case you use those other parts of the library. Okay. Okay. And um, all right, last one for now. Um, so merge base can generate S bombs for systems where you don't have the source code and wouldn't those be less accurate? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, we can do that. Um, so I could, I could do that right now, right? Like just, uh, grab the S bomb for this particular system. That's very uh, cool. And, um, no, but it, uh, the, if in, in a way, I would actually say that the um, the S bombs that we generate from the the production systems are more accurate because they represent exactly what ends up being in production, right? Because since we're looking at all the libraries that are there on disk in production and, and building the S bomb from that, and then you know we have uh, a very good techniques for determining the identity of the components in production, no matter what strange uh, contortions they went through to get there. Um, you know, I actually have examples uh, that I could, uh, I'd love to, to share more in depth, um, where the, the source SBOM is actually incorrect, right? Because the source SBOM has, um, is based on the developer specifying a dependency, but then that dependency itself is comprised of many other additional dependencies that uh, aren't, uh, aren't present, you know, aren't, um, <laughs> articulated in that source representation. But then when you look at the binary representation, well, that's the reality, that's the ground truth. Uh, and so, you know, if anything, our, our production-based SBOMs, I would say are more accurate um, in some cases. I mean, in lots of cases, the source representation and the production representation do match. Um, and, and that's a good thing, that's what you wanna see. But, um, and then there's other reasons too, right? Like build processes can do weird things, right? The middle of your build system, it might download from some weird area or it might copy things from weird areas. You know, every it, it's not always a one-to-one -one mapping from um, source to production. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. I think that's all we've got for now. Did you have... Um... Other stuff to run through, or sure. I mean, if we've got time, I um, I guess I can um, I could uh, do the breach, and let's then just... do the breach, and then we will. Um, we've got some other questions coming in here, so how about do the breach, and then I'll talk sure. more questions your way. Okay, I'm gonna just stop sharing because I just have to grab um, some. Uh, I just have to grab the commands to do the breach. So I'll just uh, see if I can remember how to grab the commands to do the breach. One second. And folks, uh, well, Julius is handling that. Don't be shy. Send in some more questions here. We've got time for them. We would love to get those answered for you. Okay, almost. Oh, there it is. And bring up the terminal. And okay, and I'll start sharing my screen again here. Do that infinity thing again. Hmm. Um, be trying to make the browser go away. Okay. There we go. Uh, cybersecurity professionals on the call will be familiar with Cali and with uh, Metasploit. Um, Okay, so 
so what I've done here is um, I've put um, um, our struts.mergebase.com. I put it basically in the sites here of a Metasploit, and I've asked a Metasploit to to please uh, breach the system. Um, and so you know that's the problem here is without any credentials. Um, Um, we're able to just break right into the system and start arbitrary, uh, executing arbitrary commands. Um, it's, what is the command again? Is it start? Um, Oh, perhaps it is blocked. Go back in. Oh, yeah. I blocked. <laughs> I already yeah. blocked it. So we're doing the, the inverse. So the system was protected uh, from being exploited by, the, by that. And uh, now we're going to remove the protection. Let me just make sure all the, the blocks are removed. OK, we're going to remove you as well. No, you're just monitoring. And you're just monitoring. OK. So um, yeah, so now, yeah, sort of the inverse. So I was able to execute a command. Um, wait, um, is it that? Yeah. And then you can say, oh, I'm running as a Tomcat user. Okay. And um, for the, the inverse of what we normally show. Normally, we'd show the breach and then show how Mergeus prevented it. But this time, we showed how Mergeus was preventing it and then how Mergeus um, uh, allowed it through. Yeah. Very effective. Um, yeah. Shall we um, yeah. head into it. the uh, Q&A? You got it. We have some other questions here. And uh, let's see, I'll turn my camera back on that way. We can talk face to face. I won't be blocking your slides. <laughs> um, all right. So if I'm here's a here's a pretty general one to start off with. If I'm thinking about starting up an AppSec program with my group, how would MergeBase fit into that? Um, OK. So I'd say like um, if you haven't if you haven't run AppSec before, like sh you probably have cybersecurity programs and inf you know firewalls and information security programs, but this is your first time getting into AppSec application security. Um, so merge face beat, we're an SCA, uh, so we're a scanner. And I'd say on the scanning side, what you see is you see um, what's called um, SAST, Static Application Security Testing, and then DAST. I, so many acronyms in this industry. It's, it's a acronym heavy industry, um, which is Dynamic Application Security Testing, and then SCA, which is um, um, Software Composition Analysis. Sadly, SCA as an acronym does not have the word security in it. And I mean, of those, those are sort of the three main scanning approaches that uh, companies will employ. Of course, you have your training component. You you know you want to train your your teams to 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 really work with security in mind, and you have your pen testing aspects, right? You want to hire um, experts to try and breach your systems and, and learn from that. But really, in terms of the scanning side, I think uh, software composition analysis uh, is nice. So you know, merge base specifically, <laughs> um, uh, because these uh, vulnerabilities are so um, almost mass market, right? Like it's like, oh, you're using this library, this version, right? It's like, like we saw with our own struts.mergebase.com, right? Like the attackers are just they're just scanning everything, and it's it's all sort of automated, and so I think really with SCA you get those recall notices and you 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 know you get off those vulnerable versions and then you, you, your system i think is like a lot noticeably uh more secure once you've done that whereas with the sas the static application testing like 
really what that is, is looking at your own source code and trying to look for insecure coding patterns within your own source code. But the attackers are going to have, you know, uh, they don't have that visibility into your system. Whereas with the, um, with the vulnerable libraries, it's really just, you know, plug and play, just like, you know, automated probing. Do, are they running this version of this library? You know, are they running Heartbleed is kind of almost an example. Right. Yeah. Okay. So to kind of build on that, um, we have a question here that's talking about how most SCA tools are integrated with development processes. So they're like shifted left. But I know you were talking earlier about how MergeBase can also integrate with running systems in production. So they're like shifted to the right. So why is it done that way? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, we compete with uh, the other SCA uh, tools in the space, right? And so we can shift left as well. Um, what's uh, unique about us is, you know, we can shift left, we can kind of do the middle, you know, the build area, and then, but we can shift right. And for us, that was just important because um, when you shift right, you know, to the production runtime, and that's those are the crown jewels. That's what you're trying to protect, and and we just really wanted to to make sure. That, that that part of the the software deployment system was you know adequately protected yeah it makes sense so then you've got the whole the whole pipeline covered yeah i mean if you look at the equifax uh, disaster right the debacle in 2017 right like that was not a i don't believe that was an actively maintained system it was one of these holding pattern older legacy systems it was running on sparks right S uh, solaris spark cpus these were solaris boxes right like when's the last time anyone talked about solaris but here was these solaris boxes on spark cpus running java running struts right and it was exactly that kind of scenario like these old production machines off in a closet that nobody really is keeping an eye on where where it's like you know, we need someone to also be able to handle those scenarios as well. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think we've got time for one more. So let's get to where do you think SCA and SBOM will be in 10 years from now? And what's your long term vision? Okay. SCA and SBOM. Um, yeah, 10 years from now, <laughs> it's hard to imagine. I know, right? Yeah. Um, it'd be nice, right? Like it would be nice if, you know, like our, I'm, I mean, I'm really just uh, off the top of my head here. This is probably completely wrong, but I am willing to bet anyone in the audience $5 on it anyway. Ooh. So 10 years from now, you can come get your $5 from me. Um, I'm going to say libraries in 10 years will just self-update themselves, right? That seems insane, doesn't it? Because that means the system would have to tolerate that. So you build a system, and then your libraries in production are just self-upgrading just at night by themselves, right? And so, um, yeah, I mean, the the... the the consequences, the implications there are sort of insane. Like, uh, I've never tested this. I've never tested this um, this combination of libraries. Like, how would that ever work? But it's maybe it's one of those things where if you just say it has to be this way, then it sort of magically works. It could be. I guess we'll have to meet back here in 10 years and find out. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying okay. to think. Let's say, uh, should it be... I'll say at least 20% of systems will have at least 20% of their libraries self-upgrading. Okay. In 10 that years. That seems like a safe bet. Yeah. And then um, and so people can get, and $5 American, by the way. Oh. Not, okay. not, not our fake Canadian dollars here where I'm sitting. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you so very much for that. Um, just a reminder to the audience before we close down, the session has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of it, you'll be able to go back and watch it again. We will send you an email with instructions for accessing this webinar on demand. So keep an eye on your inbox 
for that. I um, went ahead and drew our Amazon gift card winners for the session, and they are J.T., Alan D., Ernesto R., and Hongyan J. Congratulations to all our winners today. We'll send you a separate email with instructions for claiming your gift card. So keep an eye on inbox for that email. And if you don't see it there, check your spam folders. All right. So with that, thank you so much, Julius. This was really fun. And thank you so much to the audience for spending your time with us. We hope to see you again soon. I am Sharon Florentine signing off. Bye. Thanks so much, Sharon.